Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video. And today I'm here with my Jane Austen July wrap up to tell you all about the books that I read in the month of July. So in July I read 12 and a half books um, and July for me was Jane Austen July which is a month-long readathon I host with Claudia from Spencer's Library and Marissa from Blatantly Bookish all about reading books by and in connection with and to do with Jane Austen. So I will start off in my wrap up as I always do with talking about the classics that I read in July um, and let me start off with the three works by Jane Austen that I read in July. Um, so I read Pride and Prejudice which is my favourite Jane Austen novel and I love it hugely. It's one of my favourite books of all time. This if you don't know is the story of the Bennett family, um, Mr and Mrs Bennett and their five daughters, specifically focusing on the eldest two daughters, Elizabeth and Jane, and their romantic relationships. It is a truly, truly fantastic, wonderful love story, as well as being um, a really kind of sharp and interesting look at um, social issues at the time in the Regency period. It is fantastically written. It is absolutely hilarious. The characterization is amazing and I just absolutely love it. This is like the 10th or 11th time I've read it and every time I read it I just love it even more. So and truly truly fantastic read highly highly recommend always one of my favorite books ever so that was great and then this Jane Austen July I also read Sense and Sensibility which I actually listened to on audiobook I listened to the audiobook narrated by Rosamund Pike which is a really fantastic one I definitely recommend I really recommend her audiobook of Pride and Prejudice too and I love Sense and Sensibility um and Sense and Sensibility has historically always been like my least favorite or my second to least favorite Jane Austen but this year rereading it I just absolutely fell in love with it I have done the whole video talking about my changing feelings about Sense and Sensibility which I'll link down below so I won't talk about it too much here but there was just something about Sense and Sensibility which this year really got to me um, and which I just thoroughly thoroughly loved so very very exciting um, to after many many rereads um, really feel like I've fallen in love with Sense and Sensibility so that was exciting. Um, so Sense and Sensibility is the story of the Dashwood family um, Mrs Dashwood and her three daughters Eleanor, Marianne and Margaret um, specifically focusing on Eleanor and Marianne. Eleanor is very very sensible and practical and likes to hide her emotions um, and Marianne is very very emotional and passionate and the book is a lot about their relationship and their very very different characters um, as well as about the people they meet um, when at the beginning of the novel um, they have lost their family home um, and have to move away and it's just so interesting in so many ways. I feel like the way this book looks at kind of um, rationality versus emotion is really fantastic. I feel like the minor characters and the sibling relationships and the sort of pseudo sibling relationships in this book are fantastic. And there's just an awful lot of things that I loved about it um, more this time than I ever had before. So I would really recommend Sense and Sensibility if it has been historically one of your least favorite Jane Austens, then maybe do give it another try. Um, I'll link that video down below where I talk in more detail about why I loved it, but it just, yeah. I don't know, after a long time of not really loving Sense and Sensibility as much as the rest of Jane Austen, I really, really, really enjoyed my read of it this year. Then the other work by Jane Austen I read this July was Lady Susan, um, which I read in this bind up here, um, which contains um, sort of some of her juvenilia, her unfinished and shorter works and Lady Susan. Lady Susan is an epistolary novella and um, it's finished, but Jane Austen um, didn't publish it in her lifetime. It was published um, a long time after her death, um, several decades after her death. And it it is a very scandalous, um, really, really interesting, engaging novella about a woman called Lady Susan who um, is very cunning and very manipulative and um, is trying to marry off her daughter to the wealthiest suitors she can find. Lady Susan is a widow in her 30s. She's very scandalous in her behaviour. Um, she is considered a flirt and a coquette and she's determined to kind of make everyone around her and behave as she wishes them to do for her own advantage. And she's just a fantastic, wonderful character to follow. I love Lady Susan. I think it is really underrated. It's really interesting because all of Jane Austen's novels have a lot of social critique in them. And I feel like in a lot of Jane Austen's novels, it's slightly more subtle and it is kind of um, done within the framework of the marriage plot um, which means that she can kind of um, criticise society um, under like the cover of a more conventional storyline I guess whereas Lady Susan is like entirely unconventional and um, much wilder and more scandalous and I really really love it so I'd highly highly recommend Lady Susan if you haven't read it yet and it was lovely to reread it again this year. So those are my Jane Austen reads for this Jane Austen July but I also read two other books which um, were published during Jane Austen's lifetime um, so first here I have The Old English Baron by Clara Reeve and um, this 
this is a gothic novel from 1778, I think, so um, just after Jane Austen was born. Um, and we know that Jane Austen found gothic literature interesting. She obviously parodies gothic literature quite a lot in Northanger Abbey. Um, and I have read a couple of gothic novels from the 18th century, um, but I have a meaning to read more. Um, and I really enjoyed The Old English Baron. Um, so this is sort of a retelling slash reimagining of um, The Castle of Otranto, which is um, another 18th century gothic novel. But Clara Reeve wanted to kind of rewrite The Castle of Otranto set in England um, and set in medieval England and kind of make it more realistic. Um, so it is gothic, but it is sort of like more subtly gothic than The Castle of Otranto and then some other gothic literature from the time. Um, I really enjoyed this. I thought it was really readable, much more readable than a lot of other 18th century stuff I have picked up. The characterization was still a little bit flat, as I do basically find with nearly everything I read from before the time of Jane Austen, um, but I found the writing really readable and engaging. Basically, this book is following um, the family of an old English baron, um, his children, and also um, his ward, who is kind of a peasant boy from the village, um, who he's sort of taken into his household to educate um, because this young boy showed a lot of promise. And in this big grand house where the old English baron lives, um, there is this wing of the house that is shut up because of some um, secret history to do with the previous owners. And obviously all of this stuff is going to come to light um, and nothing is quite what it seems. I really enjoyed it and it's quite a quick read. So I think it's one I'd recommend, especially if you're kind of interested in 18th century Gothic literature, but you don't really know where to start and you're a bit um, intimidated by some of the other books, then this one might be worth a read. Then I also read Waverley by Sir Walter Scott. This was first published in 1814. Um, like The Old English Baron, this is historical fiction. So although it was published in 1814, um, it's set 60 years before then, um, during one of the Jacobite uprisings in Scotland. We're following a young man called Edward Waverley, who is a soldier. And Waverley kind of finds his loyalty torn between two different causes, um, while at the same time, um, he is kind of torn between two different women who he is potentially gonna fall in love with. I've been kind of getting into Walter Scott this year, which has been quite nice. Um, I read a book by him earlier this year called The Talisman. I probably prefer The Talisman to Waverley. Um, I did enjoy Waverley, um, but I do feel like it's quite long and um, I feel like the story didn't necessarily warrant the length in all places. Um, I did find it quite readable and I did enjoy it, um, but I feel like I liked the character relationships and the love stories better than I liked the political stuff. I found some of the political stuff harder to follow. Um, but I still really enjoyed it as a whole. Um, I like Sir Walter Scott. I'm excited that I finally got into his work and I want to read more by him in the future. Next, I have some modern novels to talk about and um, some historical fiction set in Jane Austen's time. So first, I want to talk about Infamous by Lex Croucher. This was absolutely huge fun and I just adored it. So this is a sort of rom-com slash coming of age story set in the Regency period. And um, we're following two childhood friends, Edith and Rose. Um, and Edith who is usually known as Eddie, really wants to be a writer. Um, and Rose and her have been friends for a very, very long time. Um, but now they are um, in their early 20s, they're out in society, and Rose is talking about getting married. And Eddie doesn't really know how to handle this because she doesn't want Rose to get married. She doesn't want anything in their lives to change. And then everything really does change when Eddie meets a very famous poet um, who she has been kind of following his work for a long time. Um, and they become friends and um, this scandalous poet invites um, her and Rose and various other people to come and stay in his big crumbling gothic mansion. Um, it's just like excellent, excellent fun. Like absolutely huge fun. It's so funny and it's so witty and it's so smart and clever and the coming of age story in it was really good and the love story plot lines in it were really, really good. Everything about Eddie's writing I really, really enjoyed too and all in all it was just like an utter joy. I really, really love Lex Croucher's books and I can't wait to see what they do next. They actually worked on their first novel, Reputation which came out um, last year. Um, I worked on that um, in my previous job when I used to work as an assistant editor at Bonnier. I didn't work on this one, but I was hugely excited to read it. And yeah, can't wait to read whatever Alex does in the future because this was just magnificent. Then I also read God Mushroom Park by Jill Hornby, which was another like highlight of the month. This was truly, truly amazing. Um, so I read Jill Hornby's book, um, Miss Austen, um, when it came out a couple of years ago and loved it and Gobbish Park was just as good. Um, so this is a work of historical fiction set in the early 19th century um, and it is following the lives of real people. So our main character is a woman called Anne Sharp who was the governess to Fanny Knight um, who was the niece of Jane Austen. Um, so this book is about Anne Sharp um, arriving at Gobbish Park as 
a governess, her work as a governess, and what happens when she meets um, both Henry Austin and Jane Austen when they come to stay. So it's partly about Anne's friendship with um, Jane Austen, which we know was a real thing. I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Um, but it's also about Anne's kind of work as a governess, um, her struggles with her health, her struggles to um, kind of find a place for herself in a society where, as a governess, her position is really uncertain always. Um, and I just really, really love this for lots of reasons. I feel like um, the way Jill Hornby kind of characterised all the Austen family just felt like like they are in my head, um, especially the way like Henry and Jane are done. Like it just felt so true to me to what I know from their letters and biographies and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I also feel like the way it explored kind of Anne's social position was fantastic. I loved Anne's kind of friendship with Henry and Jane. I feel like that was done really well. I loved all the like little um, hints towards like Mansfield Park and all the like Mansfield Park references in this. Um, the way that like Anne Sharp kind of within the household and within her kind of uncertain health kind of mirrors like Fanny Price's position within the house um, in Mansfield Park. Um, and then like when Henry and Jane like come to stay, like they're sort of like the Crawfords in a way, even though Anne kind of likes them a lot more than Fanny does. Um, and then there's all this stuff to do with amateur dramatics. Um, although Anne Sharp, unlike Fanny Price in Mansfield Park, loves amateur dramatics and she's a very keen writer in her own right. She wants to write play scripts. Um, and I just like loved everything about this book, basically. It was just an utter delight. Truly fantastic. Highly, highly, highly recommended it. Loved it so, so much. And I also read The Austin Project by Kathleen A. Flynn. Um, this was a really fun kind of like historical fiction slash sci-fi mashup, which I really enjoyed. Um, so this is about a woman um, who is living at some unnamed point in the future, um, and her and a colleague are sent back in time um, into um, the early 19th century to meet Jane Austen um, in order to uncover um, the manuscript of the Watsons. The idea being that um, the Watsons was in fact finished um, and they've been sent back in time to try and uncover the manuscript. Um, so they are from the future um, but they are kind of pretending to be um, people from the early 19th century um, and they kind of befriend Henry Austin and ultimately end up meeting Jane Austen. There's a lot of really fun elements to it. I feel like the kind of historical detail but also the like hints at the futuristic world that they're from were really nicely done. Um, I feel like again Jane and Henry Austin's characters felt like really well done and true to what I do know about those two people. Um, I read this immediately after reading Gobbleshaw Park um, and because Henry Austin had been a really big part of Gobbleshaw Park as well it was quite fun that he was also a big part of the Austin project um, especially because Henry Austin's like my favourite Austin sibling after Jane. He's very very interesting and I've like read a dual biography of him and um, Jane together so he's a really interesting figure and it was quite nice to read quite a lot of fictionalised versions of him this month um, so I really really enjoyed that I also feel like the kind of romance stuff in it was done really well um, and it was just a really really fun read so definitely one I'd recommend um, and I feel like it did a really good job of like being fun and silly but also like quite moving um, and serious in places um, and yeah just really really liked it so uh, one I would definitely recommend as well Moving on to some contemporary retellings of Jane Austen. Um, this month I also read Written in the Stars by Alexandria Bellefleur, um, which is sort of a Pride and Prejudice retelling. So Written in the Stars follows a young woman called Elle, um, which is short for Elizabeth, who in the very first chapter goes on a very disastrous first date with a woman called Darcy, um, who she's been set up with by Darcy's brother, who is one of her colleagues. Darcy and Elle really don't hit it off. They don't get on well at all. Um, but after the date when Darcy's brother asks her how it went. Um, she pretends that it went really well um, in order to stop him continually setting her up with different people because she doesn't want him to do that. Um, and through various circumstances, Darcy and Elle um, start to like pretend that they're in a relationship um, in order to like satisfy Brendan. So basically the book is uh, enemies to lovers fake dating rom-com um, and it's a really good fun one at that. I really enjoyed this. It's really good fun and it's really well done and I feel like the characterization was great. Um, wasn't super Pride and prejudice -y, or at least like the plot was not very Pride and prejudice -y at all. Obviously um, there are two main characters who are very very different um, and the character of Darcy um, she does have lots in common with Mr Darcy from the novel Pride and Prejudice um, and Elle has some things but not that much in common with Elizabeth I would say um, she does have like a sister called Jane and Lydia but they don't really feel like they're very similar to Jane and Lydia from the book um, and the plot 
of Written in the Stars doesn't follow Pride and Prejudice at all. So it's not really a retelling, it's more that it's got like some loose inspiration from Pride and Prejudice. Um, but I do think that it does have quite a lot of like thematic influence from Pride and Prejudice too, which I really enjoyed. So Elle like runs like an online astrology consultancy business um, and basically lots of people like look down on her for that. Um, her family don't understand what she does and they you know, think she's made stupid decisions with her life um, and Darcy when they first meet really judges her too and I feel like the book kind of explores lots of themes to do with pride and prejudice um, to do with that in a really good way um, as well as to do with like how Elle judges Darcy for things so I feel like there's a lot of like thematic stuff to do with pride and prejudice in it which I really enjoyed um, even if the plot is quite different. Basically overall I really really enjoyed it um, but I'd probably recommend it more as like a general really good rom-com read rather than specifically for Jane Austen July. And the other modern Jane Austen retelling I read this month was Rare the Rhythm Takes You by Sarah Das which I really really enjoyed. This is a YA retelling of Persuasion set in Tobago. We're following 17 year old Raina and what happens when her now very famous ex-boyfriend um, reappears on the island and staying at her family's hotel um, and they are thrown together again. Um, so you can see the ways in which it is a persuasion retelling. I really really enjoyed this, it was really good fun, a really great love story, really just enjoyed reading a great YA rom-com or YA romance perhaps. It was really good fun, um, I feel like it dealt with the kind of persuasion theme very well as well as looking at grief and like art and music in a way that I really liked. It's not like a really really strict retelling of persuasion, um, like the plot isn't following things beat by beat but there were a lot of characters who were equating to other characters from Persuasion which I really enjoyed and I feel like it is much more of a retelling than Written in the Stars um, is if that makes sense. I really really enjoyed Where the Rhythm Takes You, I feel like it had a really nice blend of like fun moments and really moving moments um, and yeah it was just a really good read so definitely one I would recommend and a really good Persuasion retelling and it was also really nice to read a Jane Austen retelling that wasn't of Pride and Prejudice because I feel like nearly every retelling I read tends to be of Pride and Prejudice because there are so many so it was really nice to read a Persuasion one this year. Finally I read two and a half or really more like two and a quarter works of non-fiction about Jane Austen in the month of July. So one thing I read which I listened to on audiobook was The Genius of Jane Austen by Paula Byrne and this was a really 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 fantastic read. So the full title of this including the subtitle is The Genius of Jane Austen, Her Love of Theatre and Why She's a Hit in Hollywood. Um, the book is really much more about Jane Austen's love of theatre than it is about why she's a hit in Hollywood uh, but to be honest that was the side of it that interested me more so I'm kind of happy with that. Um, and basically this book is about Jane Austen and her relationship with the theatre. Um, so the book kind of starts off with a survey of Jane Austen's letters and her references to going to the theatre and going to see plays and reading plays um, in her letters, kind of exploring the fact that we have so much evidence for how much Jane Austen loved the theatre. And then the rest of the book kind of goes through um, her juvenilia and um, four of her novels, Pride and Prejudice, Sense Sensibility, Mansell Park and Emma, and looks at the way that all of these books are kind of in conversation with theatre. Um, and it really kind of positions Jane Austen as kind of the inheritor of um, the theatrical tradition more than the kind of novel tradition, which I found really interesting because when I read novels written before Jane Austen, I often find them quite lacking, but actually I do quite like drama written before Jane Austen. Um, so maybe that is because Jane Austen is kind of more following in the footsteps of dramatists and playwrights than she is of novel writers of her time um, and I feel like the way Paula Byrne kind of looks at um, how Jane Austen was in conversation with the literature of her time, both novels but also primarily plays, um, and how she was kind of using tropes from plays and how kind of um, watching plays and loving plays kind of influenced the way she writes dialogue like I feel like all of that stuff was so so interesting. I also would say that like um, I haven't mentioned earlier in this video that I really fell in love with Sense Sensibility this month. I feel like part of that was because of Paula Bird's chapter on Sense Sensibility where she just said like lots of really fascinating things that I hadn't thought of before about Sense Sensibility and put Sense Sensibility in like context. Um, with the literature of the day much more than I had ever thought about it before. You know, like I always think of Northang Abbey as being like a parody of the gothic genre, but I haven't really thought before about how Sense Sensibility is also like parodying a lot of literature of the time, um, both plays and novels and um, kind of in the sentimental tradition. I sort of was vaguely aware of that, but I hadn't really clocked it. Um, and the way Paula Byrne talks about that, it talks about like all the mirroring and doubling in Sense Sensibility, like it was just great. I just really, really loved the genius of Jane Austen. So definitely, definitely one I would recommend. Recommend. Fantastic literary criticism, highly worth a read. 
And then I also read this work of nonfiction. This is A Truth Universally Acknowledged, 33 Great Writers on Why We Read Jane Austen. Um, so this is a collection of essays um, about Jane Austen um, from other writers. So some of these are new essays kind of written in the 21st century, and then some of them are essays by classic writers. So there's like an essay by C.S. Lewis in here, by Ian Forster, by Virginia Woolf, um, kind of essays that have been pulled out um, from other places and put into here. Um, but this is just a really interesting read. Um, as you would often expect with an anthology of essays written by different people. Some essays were better than others. Some essays I feel like I got much more out of than others. Um, but in general, it was just a really, really, really interesting read. Um, and I really enjoyed a lot of the essays in here. Um, and the essay by Virginia Woolf um, called Jane Austen at 60, which I hadn't read before, like moved me to tears. So yeah, there were just a lot of fantastic essays in here. It's really, really worth a read if you're someone who loves Jane Austen. I think it's a really interesting kind of varied collection of essays. So yeah. Definitely one I'd recommend and I really enjoyed it. And then finally, um, the last non-fiction thing that I read some of in July was this. Um, this is The Secret Sisterhood by Emily Midori Kawa and Emma Claire Sweeney. So this book is split into four parts um, and looks at the kind of literary friendships of four writers. And I only read the first section in the book this month, which is the section about the friendship between Jane Austen and Anne Sharp. Anne Sharp being, as I've already mentioned, um, the historical figure who ends up being the main character in Godmotron Park. Um, so I really enjoyed reading the chapters about Jane Austen's friendship with Anne Sharp. Um, I feel like I would have enjoyed them anyway, but I feel like reading those chapters was really enriched by the fact I'd just read Godmotron Park and it was really nice to like, find out more about this character who I'd fallen in love with, like, and find out more about her, like, actual life um, and what really happened to her, what we really do and don't know about her, um, how much the stuff in Godmotion Park was true, what happened to Anne Sharp after the end of the novel. Like, I just really, really enjoyed reading those chapters, having just read Godmotion Park. So for anyone else who's read Godmotion Park this month and loved it, um, I would really recommend picking up The Secret Sisterhood. Um, I really enjoyed the section on Jane Austen and Anne Sharp, and I really enjoyed the introduction. I thought... They were really interesting and it's kind of well-written, engaging non-fiction. So I'm going to keep reading this in August um, and read the next few chapters. And those are on um, Charlotte Bronte's friendship with Mary Taylor, George Eliot's friendship with Harriet Beecher Stowe, and Catherine Mansfield's friendship with Virginia Woolf. Um, and I think that those are all going to be really interesting too. So I'm enjoying this so far. I'm glad I read a bit of it in Jane Austen July and I'll carry it over to August. And that's it. Those are the things that I read in the month of July. Um, I'm really pleased with my Jane Austen July reading. I read lots of books that I really enjoyed um so yeah let me know down in the comments what you read for Jane Austen July what was your favorite thing you read this month and that's all thank you so much for watching and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video